The writing muse found Jennifer Hillier early, inspiring her to write her first story at age six. Even at that tender age, her writing leaned toward the dark side, as the first story was a reimagining of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. But in Hillier's vision, Snow White killed the queen in an act of calculated vengeance. After dabbling for years, Hillier got serious about writing after a move to Seattle in her early 30s. Her first novel, Creep, was published in 2011, and she has explored the fringes of society where people do dark, twisted things in five more novels, including 2018's Jar of Hearts, which won the Thriller Award and was shortlisted for the Anthony and McCavity Awards. Her latest novel, Little Secrets, will be released on April 21st, but it's no little secret that when Jennifer Hillier publishes a novel, it's a must read. Let's welcome Jennifer Hillier to the show. Hello, welcome, hello. Jennifer. How are you? Welcome, welcome. Ooh, she wins. Look how big that cup is. <laughs> Water. A lot of good stuff mm. in that one. <laughs> so let's get right into it, guys. Uh, Jennifer, your latest book, Jar of Hearts, was a fantastic, enjoyable read. Oh, it's one I couldn't put down and I finished rather here. quickly. Um, it's rightly received a ton of praise and the buzz and reviews surrounding your latest book, Little Secrets, which comes out on April 21st, is even greater. So without giving too much away, can you tell our audience what they can expect in Little Secrets? Uh, Little Secrets, it's a, it's a psychological thriller, same as Jar of Hearts, only there's no serial killer in it. So um, this is my sixth novel and the first one where I don't have this a serial killer running rampant. So that was weird um, as a writer to not kill a lot of people. As <laughs> writer. Um, but it opens with um, a woman and her son at a really busy farmer's market. And he's four years old and it's right before Christmas and she loses him. Um, she loses him. She loses him. And she looks down and he's not there. And, uh, and then basically she never, they never get him back. Um, that's how the book opens. It's sort of watching her spiral into this uh, very dark place um, because of course she blames herself for all of it. Um, and then it's, it, then things go really badly when she discovers her husband is cheating on her. <laughs> mm. oh, there we go. <laughs> so there's a lot of, a lot of mom rage. <laughs> Life rage in the book. It's very cathartic to write about, though. <laughs> yeah, I, bet. I can imagine. I can imagine. Ooh, I remember losing my kid for the first time in a department store, and I just remembered the panic that I had felt. So I can only imagine that. It's awful. When the last time I traveled, I she was going to Dallas, Brachacon. Um, I brought my my four year old because he's four. Because I'm a sick puppy writing about a four year old. <laughs> when I have a four year old. <laughs> um, we got to the airport in Toronto and we lost him for about two seconds. It was so busy that morning flying out to Dallas that we both looked down and he was not there. And I was like, that's it. That's karma. You write about this, sh you know, this shit happening. <laughs> and I just hated it. <laughs> manifested it. He's gone. And we found him like a second later, but literally the longest, most awful two seconds of my life. So. Oh, nothing ages you that fast like that. Yeah, that's Parents worst nightmare. So relieved and so mad all at the same time. Like, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> um, which upset him and then everyone was upset and it's like, okay, let's just go. <laughs> <laughs> so Jennifer, uh, as Chris mentioned, um, Jar of Hearts, you know, got a ton of praise, ton of critical acclaim, and of course you won the award at Thriller Fest, which yeah. was just amazing. Yeah. Um, Bravo, did, bravo. Mm -hmm. All downhill did, from here. Yeah, <laughs> it's all downhill, no. of course. No. But no, did, did winning that award and getting that critical appraise, did it, um, did it kind of give you the validation for all the hard work you had put in for years with multiple uh, books? You know, it weirdly did, and I was really surprised by how much it meant to me because when I started on this whole writing journey, I was, I was like, I'm going to write thrillers. I'm going to be a commercial writer. I'm hoping for, you know, for some decent commercial success. I don't expect to be the kind of writer who wins awards or has books that people discuss. I just want to write a story that people can read on the beach on vacation and not think too hard about, but it entertains 
and maybe lingers with you a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm fine with that. I'm fine with, you know, that's how I've defined, you know, what my goals are. I'm okay not winning awards. And, and you know, there are so many great books that win those awards. So when I got the, um, the nomination, it was probably the first time ever in 10 years that I felt like a huge sense of imposter syndrome. Um, I felt that before where I'm like, okay, this isn't, yeah, this can't be happening to me. They've made a huge mistake. Um, that is not that kind of book or is it? No, it's not that kind of book. <laughs> and so then, you know, and then I was really nervous and it was going into the, into Thriller Fest, which I go to every year and I love it. I was so nervous and it was such a weird feeling because I was nervous for an award. I was so sure I was not going to win. So why am I nervous? Like it's going to go to someone else. And so when they called my name, I think I had a moment of, oh, it's me. And then, oh, I have to get up there. Like, like, <laughs> I, I didn't prepare day, anything. Oh my God, I have to get up there. You know? and, <laughs> but it was a huge moment. And it was so like, it was, it felt better than I wanted to admit that it would feel. Um, and uh, it was awesome. just nice to win it at Thriller Fest, which is my favorite event. So yeah, no kidding. Yeah. It's going to be hard to top how that felt, actually. <laughs> Which is depressing. Thinking, oh. yeah, when the movie comes out, you'll be good. <laughs> Maybe. You won't be nervous going this time, at least, because yeah, right. you'll be like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've already won it. Whatever. <laughs> You're the returning champion. <laughs> well, one of the things that sticks out and really impresses me about your novels is that you're not afraid to center the story around flawed, imperfect characters. Uh, in fact, they're often, they have skeletons or baggage that make the reader suspicious or even wary of them. Um, but the reader cannot help to but invest in them and root for them. So what fascinates you about that, that line that those characters straddle? And how do you keep from going too far over it? You know, I just think like with human nature, I think any one of us could be a villain. You know, I think that the line is such a fine one between who is good and who is evil. And I think good people do horrible things all of the time. Um, and I think people who do really bad things are some of the time maybe not the worst people in the world. So I, I, I like writing books that confuse, not confuse the reader, but maybe have the reader questioning who's really good and who's really bad. So in Jar of Hearts, I didn't know how I felt about Gio. You know, she had done this really terrible thing and she was testifying at the trial of her boyfriend who turned out was a serial killer and she goes to prison for this horrible thing that she helped do or was involved in and then she gets out and tries to restart her life and I didn't know whether that made her a good person or a bad person I didn't know whether what she had done was worthy of forgiveness or not Um, and it was really kind of fun playing with that because I actually really really believe that all of us can can do bad things if we're in a specific set of circumstances, you know, like this show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much alcohol. Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> That's such a thing. So, uh, Jennifer, you um, th- there's this. I, I guess it's your quote that you write dark twisted. You write about dark twisted people who do dark twisted things. Yeah. Um, and so the, the titles of your book, you know, Little Secrets, Jar of Hearts, Creep, Freak the butcher they're all fantastic like dark titles but there's that one outlier uh wonderland that yeah. may at first conjure images of happiness and wonderment until you actually just look at the cover and you're like yeah no that's there's nothing fun going on in that amusement park so so can you share with us the inspiration for those dark storylines like where's that all come from you know i i imagine the worst things people do when when like i'm fascinated what by what we would do if we had no consequences you know, if there, if nothing bad could happen to you, like if you wouldn't get put in jail or get arrested, you know, would you punch out your rude neighbor? Would you, you know, would you steal something if no one was looking? You know, is it even a crime if no one knows you did it? You know, I'm always really interested with those questions. And so I just, I think looking at the dark side of who we are as people, is just, it's a really fun place because I think, and villains, especially writing villains is great because they don't abide by the same rules that we do, you know? And so even if they get caught in the end, um, they get to, they get to be, you know, everything that we can't in some ways. And so, 
I think I like writing dark stories because dark things happen too. And any, anything that I could write about really has already happened in real life anyway. It's, it's you know, that's also pretty depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so when we see you this summer in Thriller Fest and you're looking around the crowd and your eyes are darting, we're going to be like, I wonder what she's saying. Yeah. Am I going to be in this next one? Me and everybody <laughs> else because we all do the same stuff. <laughs> right. That's right. That's true. So are people kind of uh, shocked at the, you know, because we all kind of know Jennifer Hillier in, in the social world as a sweet, kind, funny, very sensitive. Um, and then she writes these incredibly mm-hmm. dark and... <laughs> <laughs> and stories that you're like, where does this come from? So is there a robotic you underneath this uh, facade that you put out there that, that you're just the sweetest person on the planet? Or is... it's, No, that's, that's me. Um, uh-huh. I'm, I'm, I'm a good cheerleader. I, I'm good at, you know, yeah. I tweet with hard eyed emojis and I, I'm, I use too many exclamation marks and I know that about myself and I'm fine. <laughs> um, but all of my rage and, and darkness and fear has to go somewhere, man, right? So it goes, it goes into the books. And if, if I'm not writing is when it gets a bit funny, you know, because then what do you do with all that stuff? Oh. Um, and so I'm in between books right now and I'm getting a little antsy, you know? <laughs> I'm now mad at things I normally would not be mad about. And oh. I know that because I'm not working. That's always what happens. It has, to, it has to, you know, I have to be writing. If I'm killing people in the book, I'm not killing you, right? <laughs> Does your it. husband know this? Yes. <laughs> when we first met and we were dating, you know, so we, we've been together for six years. And, uh, you know, I was really new to the whole dating scene. It was my first relationship after my first marriage ended. And I was like, oh, my God, he's going to Google me. Like the last time I was single, there was no Google. Like you met someone, you exchanged numbers, you called, you left yeah. a message if they weren't home, right? And so now here I am in the new era of of dating and online stuff and a Facebook profile, and I'm like, he's gonna Google me. And so I said to him, I know you're gonna Google me, but don't read anything I've written until <laughs> until I say it's okay. And he's like, okay. <laughs> now he's gonna go read it. <laughs> He didn't read anything, but he Googled and he was really, you know, alarmed because <laughs> at the time the book that I had out was Creep and Freak and I was writing The Butcher. So he was, Oh, nice. You know, and which is weird to have someone know you through your work before they know you the person. Yeah. Yeah, because that's not you. And yeah. Especially being in a relationship. It's like, yeah, that's that that is me, and I did think that, and I did write that really awful sexy, but but you know, I'm a really normal, nice person and I you know, just like to watch TV too. Until you know? the end of my book, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, that's too funny. <laughs> so uh Jennifer, you're a slush pile success story. Mm-hmm. Um which is pretty cool because uh, I think all of us have been there with agents uh that are on this program. And uh, my question though is what would you say to aspiring authors who, you know, are dumping emails into the yeah. literary inbox, what, what do you have to say to them since, since you actually are one that, that made it? Um, you have to always be working on the next thing, you know, and it's such an annoying yeah. thing when people tell you that. I was annoyed when people told me that because when I wrote Creep, you know, you write the book and you believe it's good enough to maybe, you know, pick up an agent and maybe get a book deal or else you wouldn't try, right? Mm-hmm. Um, And then while you're doing it, people are telling you, make sure you're working on the next thing. And you're like, shut up. This is the thing. This is the thing. I want this to be the thing. This is the thing I work really hard at. And and I can't even think about the next thing until I know what's happening with this thing. Um, But there's so much that you can't control except for um, how good your book is. And good being subjective, right? Um, But you have to be working on your craft. And so the one thing I always tell new writers is, you know, if you're not getting a response from agents, if you're not getting a book deal, um, you got to go back to the part that you can control, which is get better, um, get better, work harder. Um, mm-hmm. And it's no one wants to hear that, but that is really the only advice I would give because that's the part, you know, that's the only part of the whole job I enjoy is the writing part. The rest of it is hard, right? Because yeah. it's out of your hands. Sales is out of your hands, you know, marketing's out of your hands. It's really just what do you glean on the page, right? Mm-hmm. yeah exactly well that's what you wanted to do 
Um, so we're all, we're all husbands and, 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 and have kids. So, um, I think we all, to a certain degree, juggle life in, in our own way. So how, do, how does Jennifer uh, juggle wife and mom and celebrated author? How do you, what's, what's your daily life like doing all those things? Um, it's very, uh, the balance is hard, you know, having a kid, it's hard. Uh, My fears are so different now. Like I'm full uh, of fears. I'm scared of a lot of things. I'm scared of clowns, <laughs> I'm scared of porcelain dolls. I'm scared of balloons because you never know when they're going to pop. And that's a horrible thing. Um, I'm scared of when the doorbell rings and I'm always convinced I'm going to be invaded. And so when I go to sleep, I check the locks a million times. Um, and I think everybody might kill me. So that's, I'm a fun person to be around because I have so many heroes. You'd make a good secret service agent, by the way. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Everyone's suspicious. having a child is like, oh my God, I haven't slept since I, you know, since I had him. It's, yeah, exactly. He walks out the door and a million things could happen that are disastrous. And, you know, and as a thriller writer, having, you know, researched a lot of, and you guys know too, right? Like yeah. Research for the books you read true crime, you pay attention to all the awful things that can happen. It's like, it's always a constant state of please come back alive. Like, you know what I mean? It's right. It's awful. So it's, it's a balance of those fears. Um, and then trying to get through the day to day stuff while still, you know, still writing to a, a, a point that you feel like you haven't lost your edge. Um, because I worried when I got pregnant that I wasn't going to write the same stuff. And then, huh, um, I got more violent because I had really, because it, 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 the hormones, like so sleep God, deprived. I'm, pregnant, I'm pregnant and I had really visceral, violent dreams. And I, um, actually was on a panel with Chelsea Kane at one thriller fest and I was telling her and she's like, Oh, I wrote my first book when I was pregnant. Use all that. That's great. <laughs> oh, so, you know, I was the butcher, right. So it, it, it came out. Oh. But it was, it was really just, you know, it's, it's, a, I don't know, I've had a hard time finding a balance, but I think I've, but, but then right when I think that I get it right, you know, then he, the kid grows up a little more and then mm -hmm. have other concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really just, I'm just glad I can write and I can be a mom and I can pay a few bills. Um, that pretty much is living the dream, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. I get Dude. it. <laughs> so speaking of living the dream, you're doing what few authors do um you're sustaining a career and you're getting better every time out um how differently do you approach writing now than you did the first time out what's um, easier and what's harder yeah i think the difference from now from when i started is that i know i can finish the book um i think i had a good three books where i was really paranoid i wouldn't finish um, or that i couldn't write it or that it would be terrible and now I sort of, I, I've allowed myself to settle into, you know what you're doing, you've done this before. And even if you don't have all of the answers when you're starting, if you can see the next chapter or the next scene or the next page, you're good. Just keep going and you'll get there. So that, that's a good thing about having a little experience and maybe some wisdom um, is that you know you're going to get it done. And I've also learned that I can ask for help, um, which was really hard for me to do because... You know, query hell was so traumatic um, that you don't ever want to come across as incompetent or you don't know what you're doing or you don't know what that means. And I think I spent the first three, four years not asking questions because I was terrified people would think I was dumb for not knowing. Um, and I think I mm. finally accepted that, you know what, when they sign you to a book deal, they're on your side, actually. Yeah. Uh, they're not trying to, you know, test you or make you lose money on this. They're trying, <laughs> they're trying to get you to the finish line and they're trying to get you to create something that they can work with and sell. And, and so I've only just this past year reached out and asked for like input on something. I was really stuck on my ending for little secrets and I must have circled the dream with it like a million times. And I would go one way and change my mind and go another way and change my mind. And I finally called my agent. I had the same agent for 10 years and I love her and she's really kind. And she's like, finally, you're asking for help. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I know this is, and I'm so sorry that I'm asking. But can you please give me some input on what you think should happen here? You know, and my editor, you know, I, again, don't ask him for help. And I, I kind of go missing when I'm working on something. 
and you know he just he pokes me very gently to go hi just mm-hmm. to him. he knows if he pokes too hard i'll collapse because that's awful <laughs> but i'm trying to remember that you know everyone's on the same page and everyone wants to get to the same spot so yeah um i don't have to hold it all all of the time um, yeah. which is a good lesson for life i think <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, that's so true right um, so wait, Mike, before you go, oh yeah, go follow, ahead. quick follow up. Do you, other than your editor and your agent, is there somebody else that you do ask for help when it comes to that or no? <laughs> no terrible. So, you know, I've, so many of my, of my other writer friends, you know, they've got like beta readers and they've got, you know, their spouse reads their stuff before they do anything with it. The first person who sees my book is my agent. The second person is my editor. And and I don't know why, it doesn't have to be like that. It's not that I wouldn't appreciate the feedback, but my ideas are so fragile. Um, and I learned in workshopping um, way, way back in the day that if you express an idea um, too soon, a lot of feedback can kind of kill it, or at least yeah, for me, you know? Absolutely. Um, so I kind of have to put it all down and see what I have. But in edits, I am very open to whatever you want me to change, I will absolutely consider. But and then kind of the first stage of the, of the process, I can't let anybody see it. Um, Cause you might make one kind suggestion that messes me up. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. Totally mm-hmm. messes with my ring going, wait a minute, maybe that's true. And then I'm done. You know, I got to start over. Hmm. Well, um, but when, before you had an agent, you know, you're working on your, on your book and before you have an agent, did you go to any, like Thriller Fest, Booster Con, anything like that? Yeah, I went to one Thriller Fest um, right when I had finished Crete, my first book, but wasn't quite ready to uh, query yet. Mm-hmm. And um, I was so nervous. <sighs> I did the Craft Fest portion of it, and I didn't know anybody, and I was really shy. So I would, I would get to the panels really early and stand in the hallway so I wouldn't have to walk in when everyone was already seated. I'm so shy. <laughs> um, and then my second Thriller Fest uh, was when Creep was out and I was on the debut authors panel. Yeah. So, it was, oh my God, I can't believe I get to. And then I was really nervous about that because I had to get up and give a one minute. Oh, I did that talk. last summer. I know. Oh, did you like it though? Did you enjoy that? Because I uh, <laughs> No, I didn't. And I've, <laughs> I've performed in front of 50,000 okay. people and I stood up in front of 400 and I almost threw up. <laughs> Thank God these guys are in the audience. No, yeah, he, he literally, I don't think he took his eyes off us. He no, like looked like, at our table. I don't want to. We look just met him on else. Thursday. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so when, when you met, and I'm sure you did, even being around your literary heroes at that time, you know, these big names and you just wanted to be them so bad. Yes. Yeah. And you didn't have an agent yet, and you're still wondering, is my stuff good enough? Do I belong? Yeah. Um, did that when when you went through that, did you have a sense of that this was maybe even beyond you? Or did this give you kind of like a, a, a feeling of like, okay, I can do this? Did you have one direction or the other in, that, in those first sensations? Um, I was really so, you know, the first Thriller Fest, I, I had to be forced to get into a lineup to have Jeffrey Deaver sign Jeffrey Deaver's book, you know, <laughs> I was so nervous. I, they were like rock stars, you know, and they yeah. still, you know, I still, I still get very nervous. I saw Lee Child a couple of voucher cons ago and I squeaked at him. Like my voice <laughs> went, <laughs> did something that it hasn't done since I was 12 and it went really high and it was like, I, that's not even how I sound and that's not, can we do this over? Um, but he's a really nice guy. And um, I still feel that way, but I, I still, I don't know. You know, my heroes are in some ways of a different generation, right? Like I, I read yeah. them 20 years ago and they're kind of, um, when you're developing your own voice or your own sense of style, you know, you might mimic that a little bit, right? Cause that's kind of what you want to do too. Right. And then you find your way, right. And you find your own kind of groove. Um, and now I have a whole new set of literary heroes as well. Right. Um, and so it's, you know, I, it feels like I'm doing the exact right thing. Um, and that I'm telling the exact stories I want to tell, which is really nice. Um, I never felt that more strongly than when I wrote jar of hearts that 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 was the exact story that I wanted to tell the exact way that I wanted to tell it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I just had a sense that I think I just wanted to be a storyteller. 
and and writing was the way that I would do that. You know. Yeah. So we we've talked to a bunch of storytellers, and some of them actually, and some like really great ones, and actually they're all really great ones. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. like some, you know, some were so impressive, and some of them confess to the imposter syndrome. Um, which is, it's always shocking for like yeah. me personally to hear like, really, you don't think you're a good writer? That's, yeah, like, you think you're a fraud? Why do you, th- but why do you think that there are so many successful authors who suffer that? I think because you know from the beginning that the odds are against you, you know? And I, the day that I decided that I wanted to pursue the writing thing um, was the best worst day of my life because to know what you want to do is great. Um, and I didn't know for a long time that I worked at a lot of, you know, nine to five jobs that I, that were fine, but there was something gigantically missing in my life. And so when I figured out that I wanted to write books, novels, thrillers specifically, there was relief in knowing that, but then it was like, oh shit, you know, this is what I wanted you. Look how hard this is. Yeah. Right? It's hard. And not only is it hard, but your whole if you can survive in this business, it has almost nothing to do with anything you can control, which is not ideal. You know, um, one of my, my best friend's sister is a doctor, you know, and she knew from a very young age she wanted to be a doctor. And there's a plan for that, right? If you want to mm-hmm. be a doctor, these are the grades you get. You graduate, you go to college, you graduate, you go to med school, you know, and she knew that and she followed her plan. And so long as she achieves A, B, C, D, she will be a doctor, provided nothing goes wrong. When you're a writer, you can have an MFA or you can have, you know, a ton of experience as a writer, but you may never get published. You may never find an agent. Those things are so X factory, you know, and um, it was the worst day because I couldn't control any of that. And it's an awful thing to want. And so I think when you've had success on some level, you know, you got lucky. And there's going to be writers who go, it's not luck, it's hard work, but it is also a little bit luck. It's the right person on the right day reading your stuff on a day when it resonates and they're looking for that exact thing. You know, a lot of it is just stuff that aligns in a way that it just doesn't for someone else. You know, and I know so many writers who are ridiculously talented that are waiting for that big break and it hasn't happened yet. And I have no answers as to why, because their stuff is good. Um, but it just hasn't clicked and it's frustrating because there's no answer for that. It's just, it just yeah. hasn't. And, and all the non-writers in your life are like, well, how's the book going? How come it hasn't been published? <laughs> or what, when's it going to be published? And, think this oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It must not be any you know, good. And they also assume that, you know, you see, you, you think big numbers because maybe your contract was publicized or something like that. And people know, but then it, it's still, you know, you pay taxes, you pay your agent, right? <laughs> You're not as rich as people think you are ever, um, right. unless you are, unless you're Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're um, James Patterson or Lee Child. Right. I would and say then, there's a few that are, right. <laughs> they make um, all of it. <laughs> right. They're like the 1% of the 1% of, of yeah. you know, rock right. authors and, and really the rest of us are just, you know, you're in the middle. And if you can, like I said, if you can pay a few bills, that's huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, when I talk to, when I talk to young writers, the, the only thing I tell them is you got to love to write. You, you have to love to write. And, and I know we all want our books published and we all want them read, but you have to love to write. Otherwise you're going to be miserable. It's yeah. That has to be the main thrust, right? It's not worth it if you don't love it. And right. I, I fantasize about, like not writing at the end of every book. Like as I'm coming down, with them, like, this, is the, this is the last book I'm ever going to write because why do, what does anyone do this? Um, it's really hard and it's unpredictable and it may really totally suck. Um, so the only, the driving thing, like you said, is you have to love it. Um, you have to love it to put up with all of the ups and downs. You know, you have to love it to survive reviews. And in our job and as writers, we are, publicly criticized yeah unfairly sometimes trying to explain to a non-writer friend um she's a massage therapist i'm like imagine you know you you worked on someone for an hour and you thought you gave them a great massage and they and they then you know reviewed you right and and not on some or you know not on some like internal site but like for everyone to read and people google your name and and there it is right what do you think think of your work Um, or a performance review where you need to work on X number of things and it should be between you and your boss, but it's not, it's public, right? 
that's kind of, you have to love it to be able to put up with that. You know, it's, it's hard being criticized ever, but then to have everybody and their mom be able to read all of the stuff that people don't like about what you do. Right. Really and how much worse is it if you were working on someone for an hour and they said you did a terrible job? Well, okay, you, you, you did that for an hour. Well, you wrote a book, you spent a year on it, oh, and then wow. everyone and their brother is saying, that sucks. <laughs> why did you do that? Yeah. So, um, why did you make that decision? I'm like, okay, you write it. You know, yeah, right, exactly. It was really hard, yeah. and I thought it was the right way to go. And most of the critics decisions. can't write. So. A thousand decisions, um, and there's one you didn't, they didn't like, and that ruins it for them. Yeah, totally. that's right. not the name of that street. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> Um, so getting back to little secrets, um, you talked obviously about the fact of this is your first one that is not involving serial killers. Um, so a story often starts as a single event or thought, you know, a small seed forms in your brain. So what was that seed? What was that sprout that happened that, that gave you little secrets? How did that, how did that come about? It was, I, I had a very sort of clear vision of, a woman who just learned her husband of, of a long time, like 20 years, was cheating on her. And I wanted to write about that. I wanted to write about all of the emotions that she would go through um, if she learned that a marriage that she thought was stable and solid, you know, mm -hmm. if it wasn't, you know, and what if the woman was younger, you know, um, and what if they were rich, right? Mm. Um, and what if the, the other woman wasn't? You know, and how does that factor in at all? Does money play a role at all? And so that's kind of where I, I was. I started from there. And then as she was getting angrier and angrier, I'm like, there's something else going on. And I'm like, oh, their kid is gone. Why is their kid gone? And then that's kind of how it all began to steamroll. But I don't outline my books. And so it, as I'm writing, I never know where I'm going with it. And I thought it was going to be a book about cheating. And it was a book about a kidnapped kid. Hmm. So. Um, it, you know, I'm always the most surprised and that's not what I pitched to my editor. So that was a lot of explaining to do when, the <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, a year later, he, yeah, he emails and says, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to post a, a synopsis of it online. This is about the, what you're working on, right? This is what you sent me last year. And I'm like, oh crap, no, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not anymore. Kind of look at this because that's not at all what I ended up writing. And, uh, so we now have an agreement where I'm to communicate better. <laughs> yeah, you say you really did go radio silent. I went radio silent and, and let everyone think it was going to be one book when it, when it totally wasn't. And thank God they were okay with it. But yeah, I don't recommend that. That's, that's a what not to do. <laughs> that must have been a fun conversation. <laughs> well, um, we, you kind of answered this, what I was going to ask earlier, but I'm going to, I'm going to reframe it uh, on the front of, or the quote for a jar of hearts is, and every story there's a hero and a villain. And, but sometimes that person can be both, which I think is excellent. Um, and it's a great summary of the themes. Um, I know you said that we all can be both and I agree. Have you met someone specific in your life though, that inspired that, that you were like, this person is, big time hero and big time villain, whether they uh, helped you and stab you in the back or, or what, what was, what really drove that, that theme? Maybe, maybe my ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> There's the villain part. Um, maybe a little bit, to be honest, you know, he broke my heart. So, you know, that's not nice. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought he was nicer than that. So I just, I think anytime, you know, you go through something in your life, there's always, we want to frame something as good or bad, or this happened and it's not fair. Um, and sometimes it just is what it is, you know, and I, for a jar of hearts, you know, that story jumped off because there was a big news story here in Canada about a woman who'd been released from prison after 12 years. Um, she had helped her husband rape and murder three teenage girls one of whom was her sister. And she cut a deal. She cut a deal and went away for, to, for 12 years in exchange for putting him away for life. But now she was out and she was walking around like a regular person. So she was out and she had gotten remarried and she had children of her own and she was going to their PTA meetings like this never happened. Wow. You know? And it was infuriating to think that, oh, you did this awful thing and, and you know, but you're now trying to go straight, you know, and her whole thing was, well, I've, 
you know, I've served my time, you know, um, sure. I did my 12 years, like they told me to do. Um, and I wanted to really talk about, you know, about, is she good? You know, is she good? Is she really evil? Um, can she change? Can she be a good mom? You know, can she exist in, in the world without hurting anybody else? Seems that so far she has, but it's still infuriating, right? To, right. to think about the things that she's helped do. So, you know, it's all of my, my books sort of center around that theme of we all have a public and a private face. Um, I, I think we act one way depending on our situations of where we are. And I think we're a whole different way when we think no one's watching. You know, and there are things about ourselves that we will never tell anybody else, not even our therapists, I think, hmm. you know, and so I want to know what those secrets are. You know, there's a bit of a, a voyeur in me, I think, where I want to know what dark thing aren't you telling, you know, and it's always got to be something. So nice. We keep Eric on 24 hour video surveillance so I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that's true i don't i don't want to know <laughs> i don't want to know <laughs> no you know i i do want to comment on on that though you that's the as i read jar of hearts i was so conflicted with you i mean i, I like yeah. but i i i wanted you know i found myself rooting for everything to be okay for and then i and then i would question you know should everything be okay for and and i yeah. that was her best friend masterfully done <laughs> oh. as far as putting that emotional um sort of conflict in the reader not just the, the character i mean the story but the reader so really well you know and she was 16 when the horrible thing right. happened right? right and then yeah. i think back to when i was 16 and what a twit i was at 16 you know yeah. <laughs> and it's a dangerous combination to be 16 and be a twit but also not know that you're a twit and really think you're smart and know everything right that that's mm -hmm. That's kind of the. That's a teenager, right? That's the teenager, right? Which I'm not looking forward to those teenagers. <laughs> I don't know. But in pieces, oh. though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Something. I, I, uh, listen, I, I was like, no, not a good person. <laughs> I don't care what you try to do. <laughs> not, not a good person. Not, not who you thought. And right, I think for me, even right when I thought, you know, she's going to redeem herself in this book, it's like, ooh, no, she's not. Mm. Um, oh it's gonna get worse yeah so no nah, it was a great book yeah. so so you um did you say you had you you've been with your agent for 10 years so it'll be 10 years on february 5 i'll okay. never forget that Ooh. so in that yeah. in that span in that span of time um amazon you know we're in that age yeah. right now right. the age of amazon do right. you do you think um well can you tell me your thoughts on the current climate of traditional publishing <sighs> and is traditional publishing adapting quick enough? Um, probably not, you know, to be honest. I mean, probably not. I, I know that I'm really dependent on Amazon for, for a large chunk of my sales. Um, it's really hard to get into retail. You know, um, when, I, um, when I sign with um, Minotaur, you know, my sales for the first four books um, were were i thought good i didn't know they weren't good until until i was told they weren't good um but more so than them not being good it was it was that i learned that retailers don't like the decline in sales from one book to another they don't like it whatever number you start at they definitely don't want to see it go down mm -hmm. and so we you know there was i'm sure that it was challenging i'm sure they didn't tell me everything but there was um there was some conversation about you know some of the challenges of getting getting me and the new book, Jar of Hearts, into retail, right? So, um, but it's, you know, Amazon, the book is forever available, right? You can get right. um, ebook, um, you know, and it's, I think it's changing. And I think, um, I think publishers are probably slower than maybe they, they should have been to catch on. But I don't think any of us could have predicted this. You know, I, I don't know. I remember when iPods first came out and I thought I will never need an iPod. <laughs> I own all of my CDs. Why would I spend money on an iPod? And then two years later was like, I regret not getting an iPod. I have too many CDs. You know, it's just stuff that you can't really predict. I guess that where it's mm -hmm. going to go. We don't um, like to change. I don't yeah. like change. No. And as you can see, I'm really not good with technology. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know. I, Every, every year, everyone says that the book business is, is dying, um, that no one's buying books. And then we keep chugging along and, and writing books and, and writers are still getting book deals. And yeah, yeah. 
I don't think the book, I, don't, I think there's more readers today than ever before. It feels, it feels to me like there are, but I also yeah. feel like they're, we're accessible in ways we weren't as writers. Yeah. Um, but that, I think that might be the thing that turns the tide. Yeah. I mean, right. I would it's have, cool. growing up, I would have loved to have had right. some sort of interaction with some of the people I was reading. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I remember I met David Morell in 1995 at a writer's conference and it was like the Holy grail of, of, as a reader, you know, I was like, Oh my gosh, I got to meet my favorite author and yeah. person and talk to him. So yeah, yeah I, I can second that. I, um, when I was a kid, I read, and you might be able to see some, some of the books, you know, fantasy stories. Mm -hmm. And there was an author for the, there was a Dragonland series. Her name's Margaret Weiss. Yep. And I connected with her on Facebook and her and I have now exchanged conversations together and I'm, it like blows my mind. I'm like, I can't believe I'm able to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like fantasy camp. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Well, cause those, especially the ones you read when you were like younger, they just, they stay with you forever. Right. right? Yeah, it's true. Like, I've been reading Stephen King since I was 11. I think I would, I would squeak. At <laughs> <laughs> Double squeak. <laughs> Except that that's going to happen if we ever, or, you know, if I ever get to meet him. So when, when you, um, you probably, been, I, we've all been writing pretty much. We can all kind of go back to grade school probably, but yeah. what, when you saw your, what you worked on for the very first time in some medium outside of your house, mm -hmm. either handwritten or whatever, mm -hmm. what was your first sensation that you experienced seeing Jennifer Hillier and your story in print? What was that like for you? It was, oh my God, I'm naked and everybody's looking. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I felt very exposed. Right. Um, and very up for criticism. And it, I would say it was as scary as if they had put me in Times Square naked and asked everybody to comment on my body. It, it probably, yeah. was, that might've been preferable to be honest, because <laughs> it's so personal. Right? I like, know. You're writing, like it's. It's so personal, and and we say that all of our characters are completely fictional, and they are, but they they we borrow, right? We borrow yeah. some things that have happened to us, and there are conversations, maybe that snippets of those real conversations, you know, end up in a book. Um, it's so personal. I felt really. I still do. I still I still wrestle with feeling naked all of the time whenever a new book comes out. It's an awful feeling that I'm. I want to get better. Um, but maybe if it gets better, then it means I don't feel as much. And maybe that's not okay as a writer. I don't know. I, I haven't figured out the balance of how much mm. to care, right? Right. Because um, I want to dissociate from all those negative, scary things. But that's also partly of what makes us a good writer, right? Well, so, yeah, we're improving to right, yeah. get past our fear. We feel it and we can describe that. So, But I would say I, I felt naked and I felt exposed. And it was like, oh, God, what have I done? Right. Um, and it's, I, I would say that publishing is not for everybody. Um, even if you're a great writer, sometimes publishing is not for everybody. Yeah. yeah. So kind of totally agree with that. Talking about that, you, you've been doing this for 10 years. So not only has the sales side of publishing changed with Amazon and everything, but the marketing side has changed. It used to be that, you know, the publisher would take care of that. How have you adjusted and how have, How's it worked for you to be thrust into the social media age of, yeah, of writing I, books and, and how do you deal with that? It's a big, it's a big thing. And, you know, I, I fantasize about quitting all social media and just, you know, going <laughs> off grid, but it is not realistic as a writer to not have a presence, you know, right, yeah. gigantic and it doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Um, you kind of have to be a little bit out there. Um, but I mean, marketing, you know, they're, so for little secrets, they're, they're talking about using Instagram uh, for the first time for me mm -hmm. to help promote the book. And so one of my characters is going to have an Instagram account um, and there's mm -hmm. going to be um, some stuff sent out from her account. And um, you know, it's, I think that's, I think that's how we connect now, you know, yeah. um, even when I got back into like the dating world, you know, six years ago, I was like, this is how people meet. Like they really, like they really meet online. Like oh. you go to the bar anymore. And like, we go to the bar, but we don't talk to people. <laughs> like, and then that's exactly what it was. We go to the bar, but we don't talk to people. We meet go to the bar. We're on our phone. Yeah. You know, we're not talking. To, that's creepy. You know, I would it, never be able to date again. Yeah, I mean, either I, I would really, ugh. well, I met my husband in person. Um, thank God, because oh, I had 24 hours on the online dating thing and it was awful it was really bad. 
Um, so, so anyway, I, yeah, I mean, the world has changed. <laughs> <laughs> Get has. off my lawn. The world has changed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, Jennifer, is the end of the interview portion of this. And now Ooh. I want you to take off your thinking cap. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Don't put else. Don't put anything on because we're okay. going to go right into the lightning round where we're going to ask you. All four of us are going to ask you five questions each that are completely off topic, random, okay. completely random. Are okay. you ready? Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask. He seems very five. excited. Can you ever be ready? No. <laughs> Look at her what eyes. Gonna ask? <laughs> <laughs> These are going to throw you for a loop. Um, have you heard of the phrase "off kilter"? Yes. What is what is a kilter? It's a kilter is something that should be straight and isn't. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> now, if Eric Bishop was a serial killer, what demographic would be his targets? <sighs> People who look like his wife. <laughs> you said don't think about it. I'm, I'm no, no, beautiful. That's absolutely you don't, the best answer you, I've ever heard in my you, life. You don't realize how perfect that is. No comments. <laughs> Excellent answer. Um, <laughs> that was. I'm sorry. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 sorry. Be, no, please. That was the best answer we've ever heard in our entire career. <laughs> 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 The next one's a little bit easier, or maybe not. Uh, can you name the colors of the rainbow in order? Ooh. Not in order. Red, red, <clears throat> blue, violet, green, purple, indigo. <laughs> so indigo. There's, a, right. there's a key song that tells you, and, and I can't. Yeah, no, that was bad. I think you missed orange. Orange. Otherwise, orange you got it. Yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, I got two more. What would be the last species... To survive the apocalypse. Ooh, cockroaches. That's mm. what I would say. And Good answer. Can, yeah, they can kind of eat anything. <clears throat> and my Good. final one is um, you're a Toronto native. Good print. Your favorite Canadian rock band is? Not Nickelback. Um, oh, oh, she's our favorite guest of all time. Mm, <laughs> the Tragically Hip. Yeah. Tragically hit. That's Ooh, a that's a good one, though. Yeah. And then my, my second would be Bare Naked Ladies. Bare Naked Lady? Yeah. Love it. Dang it. If I had so a million dollars. Yeah. Eric? <laughs> I'm up. So you have to pick one, Jennifer. Do you want to swim at the sharks or do you want to skydive? Sharks. Sharks. I don't mm -hmm. think they'd be tasty, so I'm okay. <laughs> based on diet or <laughs> just i think i'd be salty oh, okay gotcha <laughs> so your favorite spot in toronto is home yeah oh there you go that's a good answer that's a good that's a very good answer yeah. um so you, you mentioned his name earlier so stephen king would like to blurb your next book who is the first person you're going to call and tell Probably my editor, honestly. Yeah. Oh, your agent's gonna be mad about that. <laughs> Shit. We edit that, yeah. <laughs> no Lightning rounds thing. don't get edited. Sorry. <laughs> <They> do not. <laughs> <laughs> so, spe uh, staying on the Stephen King side, uh, that's your favorite male author. Who is your favorite living female author? Mm, that is a. Uh, Horribly hard question. Um, I would, I would say, I would say, right now, Caroline Kepneys. I love her. I love mm -hmm. you. You know, and she writes really well, and she's something to aspire to because her stories are really like well plotted, but they're also really lyrical. So it's she's a pleasure to read. Cool. All right. Uh, my final question, staying on the uh, the the music one that Chris ended in, what is the best rock band from Seattle? Since you live there as well. Wow. I, I have a late introduction to rock bands in Seattle. I would probably say um, um, Soundgarden. Maybe. That's yeah, a good that's, answer. That's yes. a good one. I like them. I like Chris Cornell. Absolutely. 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 All right. So what is your most cliche Canadian attribute? Uh, that I love poutine. 
Okay. Well, who doesn't? <laughs> That's like the favorite thing in the world. Canada and New Orleans and, and heaven. people in the middle are like, what the hell is poutine? No, it's the best. It's that, that's the most comfort food of comfort foods of it's all time. <laughs> okay. What book or film legitimately terrified you? Uh, book was It by Stephen King and film was Paranormal Activity. Hmm. I feel like that could happen. So I, I my daughter... Uh, was going on her first date and they were going to see Paranormal Activity 2 and she was the age where she wasn't going alone so I was going to go to the theater and sit you know elsewhere and I didn't pay attention to a thing about them because I was so terrified about that movie (laughs) (laughs) and it lived it lived in my head for a good couple of weeks. I had all the lights on for about a month afterwards at home. It was scary. Oh, yeah. well, I don't watch those yeah. movies. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, you already answered this question earlier, ironically. Um, my, my question three was, do you see killers around every corner in every public space? And you already s- said yes. Mm-hmm. So instead of giving you a question, I'll give you a fact. My wife was born in Subic Bay in a broom closet. It's a true story. Ooh. Ooh. That explains a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> sorry, Mary. <laughs> my question that actually the hospital was full and they had to they had to clean out a broom closet, wow. make another delivery room. Hey, that'd be a good plot for a book. Mm-hmm. So my fourth question: What exotic animal would you most like as a pet if they could be tamed? I would want one of those ocelot cats. You know, the spotted oh, yeah. wild cats that that oh, look so. like they could be domesticated, but will probably rip your face off. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Those are cool looking. Mm. Not a cat. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and my final question is what hidden talent does Jennifer possess that most people don't know? Uh, I can make up songs. You can make up songs? Hey. Well, not the whole song. I can make up hooks to songs I'll never write, which I'm All not right. going to do now, but I can. <laughs> oh. There's I probably more money in that. Yeah. So your assignment this week is to tweet a hook about the crew reviews. There we go. <laughs> I Ooh. would retire from the writing life if I could be the next Lady Gaga. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of songwriters have made a big living yeah. yes yeah they really have all it takes is one hook actually all right i'm up <clears throat> i'm gonna read this okay. <laughs> at the upcoming 2020 thriller fest the master of ceremony diana gabaldon falls ill 10 minutes before addressing the crowd kimberly howe taps you in the shoulder and says you are now the replacement my question is, is how many Xanax tablets do you swallow? Uh, none, because I'd be <coughs> <I'm> sick. <laughs> you caught the same thing. I can't. I can't. I'm I sick. Can't do I it. Yeah, no, there's no way. There's no way. <laughs> uh, me too. All right. Other than yourself, name something that Seattle and Toronto have in common. Uh, they both have towers. They both have these, like, the part of their skyline is they, they, they have the... Um, That's so true. <clears throat> Maybe you were the reason they have the towers. Yeah, they have towers, but Toronto's is exactly three times taller, like, to the foot. Is it that big? Yeah. Dang. Like, 1,560 square feet versus 620, or square feet, yeah, feet. Yeah. It's really feet. large. Holy no. cow. They both have towers. No. Uh. In your face, Seattle. All right. <laughs> when you found out your date, now your husband, was a Packers fan, why did you keep seeing him? I don't think that I understood the depth of that like, <laughs> fanaticism. Um, I, yeah, I don't absolutely. think anyone can appreciate it until you live with a Packers fan who's actually <laughs> born and raised in Green Bay. <laughs> um, everything in Green Bay is green and gold. Yep. Um, and they are very, it's, it's, they feel it deeper than I think I can feel anything. Um, right. It's like so, having a child. <laughs> I mean, I'm a Seahawks fan and I love, I love the Seahawks, but Darren, he bleeds the Packers. It's a whole different level of, of weird. Um, <laughs> Did he show you his cheese head uh, collection? Uh, no, he's never done that, but he, um, like when he watches football, he's very quiet. Like he can't even be expressive. He's so nervous. Um, so this Sunday will be interesting because <laughs> for when Aaron Rodgers isn't playing anymore. All right. As a self-professed nectophobe, how did you survive those first few times when your son woke you in the middle of the night out of a deep sleep? Ne- what's a nectophobe? Nectophobe. Nectophobe. What? What's that? You're not going to tell me. Okay. 
How did I survive? I went through the zombie motions of attending to his needs, I think. <laughs> what does that mean? You're Very not- the dark. Wonderful. That's that's a word? Yeah. Of course the uh, doctor says it. I'm, he just makes words <laughs> up. Don't believe no. that. Yeah, he probably does. Well, I don't believe you. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, start Googling people. I have uh, trypophobia. You have what? Trypophobia. That's a fear of clusters of small holes. Really? I, I now you're making them up. <laughs> yeah, mine's a little wait, more how, wait, I, I just want to know how you found that out. When you Google it and the first image comes up, you are either not bothered or you are repulsed. And so potholes in the road, does no, that count? No, small holes, like like honeycombs. Ooh. Ah, um, really? Yes, like or like stuff that's in wood that's like got holes in it. Like, ugh, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing, and it's a thing, and I have it. So it okay, so I don't believe you. You don't believe me. So there we go. We're even. <laughs> <laughs> Are you afraid of honeycombs? It's a good cereal. <laughs> Chew up your mouth, though. All right, number five. Would you rather eat? At Aloe or Jacob's Steakhouse? Oh, I don't know because the, I love steaks, so I go wherever. Yeah? All right. Yeah. Well, Aloe's the French, you know, the top French place there in Toronto. Oh, I, I would, I've never heard of it. I'm not in that pay bracket. So. <laughs> <laughs> so when Stephen King comes in, he can take you out to Aloe then, I guess, right? <laughs> I'll go to the keg or, you know. Applebee's. So you're like Applebee's. a down-to-earth girl. You know what? Dude, probably marrying a cheesehead probably, you know, probably did that to you, right? We you're down-to-earth. They you're like a like wings their, and kind of tater tots kind of. Their yeah. cheese curds and tater tots. All right. Love it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Jennifer, <laughs> that done. is the end of the lightning round. You survived. Yeah. Oh, nice job. Handled yourself well. <laughs> yeah. You you were like very nervous at the beginning there. That was kind I of. I was a little nervous. Yeah, I don't. But you know. gave the best answer in the history of the lightning round. I we did history. love it. We <laughs> appreciated it. Eric Bishop's wife. <laughs> no, no. We'll tell you more at Thriller Fest. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. But boys, let's ra- let's raise a glass and thank Jennifer for coming on the show. Uh, Jar of Hearts was awesome. And very I good. Really look forward. We all look forward to Little Secrets coming out in April. Ooh, Thank absolutely. you very much for your time, guys. I appreciate it. It was fun. Congrats, Jennifer. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks for sticking around for another fantastic interview. We want to thank Jennifer for taking time out of her busy schedule to sit down with the crew, to talk about her writing career, and her latest novel, Little Secret, which hits bookshelves on April 21st. You'll find a link to order it down below so do it i want to thank my co-hosts mike sean and eric for the continued last we have on the show you guys have become my dearest friends and i want to thank you our listeners for your continued support but don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and tell your friends and family about our show we'll see you all on the next crew views podcast boys here's to another great show awesome you're here nice job I guarantee you I'm going to mess up this intro. I hope so. All right. So, <laughs> let's see if I can do this. I no, not. you can't. Including the 2019 ITW Thriller Award for Best Hardcover, hardcover Novel, Jar of Hearts. Oh, I knew it. He couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, you were doing great. That was perfect. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Good job, Craig. <laughs> Where's Kate Blanchett? <laughs> mm. I was working on I'm that all day. I'm Craig Albanese. What? You need to put a name tag on it says Craig this that summer. It says Craig at Thriller Fest. <laughs> I thought your name was Great. Chris. <laughs> all right. Ooh. Take two. <clears throat> all right. Deep breath. Deep breath. Don't think of clowns, balloons, or all those little holes in the ground. I don't watch any of that stuff. Honeycombs. By the way, this is my first uh, podcast post beard. Yeah, look at that thing. Like a baby's butt. It's like it's like a smooth, like a like a harp seal. Look at that thing. What would be your animal if you had kept the pet? What would it be? Uh, It'd be a grizzly bear. Of course, (laughs) Kodiak. Now, now, my second choice, it, it, it's actually a tough choice. It'd be a grizzly bear or a silverback gorilla. 
That'd be Can a you imagine one. like people Can you imagine walking go, into a bar with a sword yeah, but yeah, or people coming over and you're like, oh yeah, come, come here, come here. <laughs> meet Rocco. <laughs> I don't have a guard dog. I have a guard gorilla. <laughs>